The idea is that, a friend of mine put it this way once, if you ask why once, you're a scientist. Why is the sky blue? Why does my heart beat? Why does the world work the way it does? If you ask why more than once, twice, you're a philosopher. If you ask why more than twice, you're just a three-year-old annoying your mother. It's the sort of thing where people don't have the idea of what I do or don't even have an image. My grandmother still thinks I'm a psychologist. That when you talk to people, you know, you can say basketball player, trash man, you can say anything else, you know, a doctor or a lawyer, they'll at least have an image in their head of what the person is doing at work. When you say a philosopher, this is it, right? So, it's actually a very fair question. What is it that I do? And what I do is I look at the foundational questions underneath what everyone else is doing. Philosophy, in a certain sense, is it's a reactive discipline in that other people do work, and then we come by and ask annoying questions. Well, what exactly does that mean? And you try to get underneath of it. In my particular area, I look at a lot of things, but uh, my central training is in science, in physics in particular. You tend to find, I think, not only in physics and mathematics, which is where I, I tend to focus, if you can call it focus, but you can generally split people into two groups. There are those who are deadly resistant and think, what are you doing coming over here to play in my playground? And then there are those who say, look at this great playground, will you come and play? And I have been incredibly, incredibly fortunate to have landed here at Gettysburg where I have had a lot of playmates, where I have a significant number of colleagues, not only in the math department and in the physics department, with whom I can explore these questions, team teach classes so that we can bring students into these, that I can, in my professional work, I uh, co-write with a lot of people, but I've worked with people in the religion department, in the anthropology department, in the economics department. You know, I've got things, uh, chemistry, physics, biology. And it really is, it's a wonderful thing where there are a number of people, and maybe it's a liberal arts thing, I don't know, but there are a number of people here who just find asking those central questions to be interesting. So they made the mistake of asking me to give the opening convocation address to the incoming class. And the idea was I could give a straight talk like everybody else, or I could do something a little interesting with it. So one of my interests has been in the nature of jokes, right? I, I'm a philosopher of language. And linguistic acts, different sorts of utterances, do different sorts of things. So when you look at jokes, they're really fascinating things. You know, there are two parts to a joke. There's the setup, which gives you a situation that you think you understand in a certain way. Then along comes the punchline, right? And if it's a good joke, if it's a real zinger, what it makes you do is realize that you needed to understand that situation in the setup completely differently. And what makes a joke funny, and I had a, a psych prof when I was an undergrad who was doing research on laughter, is that it often happens when your mind is caught between two different interpretations that it's trying to reconcile but can't. And it's that tension that causes a sort of overload that is the laughter. So what makes a joke funny is when you have a setup and then a punchline that makes you think of something in a completely different way. And that's exactly what a liberal arts school is supposed to do. That's what a liberal arts education is, is to take the world around us and force you to see it in a multitude of different ways. So I was able to get away with saying that the education you will receive here is a complete joke because in a certain sense, that's a wonderful thing because joking is one model of seeing the world through different eyes, and that's exactly what the liberal arts are supposed to do. Uh, one of the projects I've just finished, uh, I, I've written a manuscript that hopefully it's moving forward in the process now. The, the working title is, Was It Morally Good For You Too? Uh, it's a book on ethical discourse. And the idea is, I think, exactly the opposite. I think 
A lot of people, especially these days because of the climate, are afraid to bring politics into the classroom. And I think reasonably so because as a professor, you're in a position of authority and the last thing you want to seem like you're doing is indoctrinating. But I think it's a matter of approach. I have no problem whatsoever bringing my politics into the classroom because it's done in a way that is open to critical discussion. Right? That what I do is, you know, I start every class with five minutes where I say, auto mechanics to quantum mechanics, ask me any question at all. And I get a wide variety of questions, but a lot of them are on current events. What do you think about this? And what I do is I try to give a well-reasoned, well-articulated answer where I say, here's why the people on the other side disagree with me. Here is the argument in favor. Here's why I think it's a stronger one. And if you can model the sort of open discourse where you're not indoctrinating, but at the same time, you're not pulling back from saying, here's what I believe and why I believe it, then I think it's a wonderful thing. And students, you know, I have a number of very conservative students. I'm very much on the other side of the spectrum. But there's a respect that they feel, even if I think they are completely wrong and I have no problem telling them that, there's a respect there that I take them seriously. And for that reason, I think politics belongs in the classroom if we can do a good job of modeling the type of discourse that we need to bring forward. And that's what I do in that book with respect to ethics. The students here are wonderful. Uh, you get very thoughtful, interesting people. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful age where they're open to possibility. You know, they come in, and my favorites are the ones who have no clue what they want to do. And I tell them, at this point, you shouldn't. Come here and play. It's a buffet. Try everything. Try things you've never heard of. And I tell them, look, I'm a philosopher. I'd never heard of philosophy. You've never heard of philosophy. You just took it because it fit your time slot, or, oh, this sounds cool. And that's what you get, is the open minds and playful minds. And that's what I love more than anything else. I have a wonderful, wonderful first year seminar this, this term. I teach a class called Einstein in Wonderland, Physics, Philosophy, and Other Nonsense. And we're reading Alice in Wonderland right now. You know, we, we looked at first at uh, Newton and Descartes and the classical notion of sense, and now we're looking at nonsense. And we have had some of the most fascinating, intricate discussions. I mean, I've taught Alice in Wonderland now probably six different times, but every time you find these students who find different angles to take the discussion in places you never realized. And you find yourself at that point realizing, wait a minute, there's some really interesting technical philosophy that you have just set up. Without knowing it, somehow we ended up in this magnificent, magical place simply by playing. And we have very interesting, playful students, and that's what keeps me going. Okay, this is, this is the opening to a piece called The Philosophical Significance of the Theory of Relativity that Hans Reichenbach wrote in uh, 1922. So relativity theory was still very new, very hot. Uh, politics at the time was such that you had science, like now, had been politicized. So the theory of relativity was, to that time, what, say, evolution is to this point. So the philosophical significance of the theory of relativity wasn't seen as a wacky thing to talk about. It really was something in the air. And Reichenbach was, he was actually one of the first six students that Einstein taught the theory of general relativity to. He was in a seminar in Berlin in 1919 with Einstein, and the two became very close friends. And uh, ultimately, Einstein got Reichenbach a position at the University of Berlin, where he remained until purged by the Nazis. So here's uh, how he opens his discussion. He says, Although there's still resistance to the theory of relativity, it should be pointed out that this resistance is founded upon conceptual objections. It's beyond dispute that the theory is physically useful, that its assertions are well verified by observable phenomena. What opponents of the theory find problematic are the ideas upon which the theory is founded. On the other hand, it's precisely these ideas that the defenders of the theory hold to be its greatest achievement and in which they claim to find the true significance of Einstein's work. It's therefore of interest 
to study the formation of these ideas, their content, and their significance. And that's exactly what he does. He's convinced that if only you were to explain the theory clear enough and present it in a way that's clean enough, there is no possible way you could object to it. And that sort of clarity, that sort of approach to argumentation, I think is, is the key to all good philosophy.